As we look now at our last session of our study of Luther and the Reformation, I want to look briefly at some of the critical responses made by Rome to the assertions and affirmations of the Protestant Reformation. There were many such reactions and responses <clears throat> besides the excommunication of Luther and his condemnation as a heretic by Leo X. But uh, the three major issues that came to the fore in the 16th century include the following. First of all, what Rome heard from Luther and the Reformers was a type of antinomianism. Antinomianism is a theologically sophisticated word for a spirit of lawlessness or libertinism where people would say that all I have to do is believe and I can live any kind of ungodly life that I choose and still be saved. It's uh, <clears throat> tantamount to what we would call cheap grace or easy believism. And so to counteract that, the Reformers had to make fine distinctions about what they meant by saving faith. As I mentioned before, Luther's formula was we are justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. We'll look at that more deeply in a few moments. But for now, in the initial definition of the ingredients of saving faith, the Reformers mentioned three specific elements. Those elements, of course, were stated in Latin, which included the notitia, ascensus, and fiducia. Now, <clears throat> those three elements involve this. The notitia is the data. Nobody's justified by believing anything. You hear in the culture, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Well, if that were true, then you could put your trust in Satan, and if you sincerely put your trust in Satan, then you would be saved. So that's absurd. Obviously, from a Christian and biblical perspective, it matters profoundly what it is that you believe. There is a content to the gospel that one must understand with the mind and be informed about it. That includes the person and work of Jesus, His saving activity. And so when we say that we're justified by faith, it's not by an empty faith or a naked faith or a faith in general. It is a faith in the person and work of Jesus. And there's real content. There is something that we are believing. Not only that, that information or data that we believe must require intellectual assent. If I say to you that Jesus was born of a virgin and He gave a death that was an atoning death and He was raised for our justification, I said, do you understand that? They said, yes. Do you believe that? What I'm asking at that point is do you affirm that those statements about Jesus are true, that you give your intellectual assent to the truth quotient of those propositions. Now, if we get that far, all we've done so far is to qualify ourselves to be demons, because the Bible says even the demons believe and tremble. But what is meant by that is the devil knows the facts. He knows the data. And not only does he know the data, he knows that the data is true. He tries everything he knows how to persuade people that it isn't true, but he knows better. Intellectually, at least, cognitively, the devil knows the truth. And so the third element that the Reformers added was fiducia, and that meant a personal trust 
and volitional assent to Jesus, not simply to the intellectual assent of the mind to the truth of the propositions, but it is the response of the heart in putting one's trust in the living Christ. Now, the 20th century Christian philosopher Gordon Clark challenged this, saying that even Paducia really is an intellectual exercise, that in the act of trusting, our mind is engaged in that. And I have no quarrel with that. I think he's absolutely right. Edwards said something very similar back in the 18th century when his definitive work on the freedom of the will, Luther, I mean, excuse me, Edwards defined the will as the mind choosing. Now, we distinguish between the mind and the will, between thinking and choosing. But what Edwards was getting at is that you can't choose something that the mind rejects. And when the mind has a certain uh, affinity towards a proposition and embraces it, that's called choosing or willing. But there's no organ next to your liver or your spleen that is called the organ of the will. The will is an activity of the mind, is what Edwards was getting at. The similar idea was set forth in the 17th century by Tariton, who distinguished not three, but six or seven aspects involved in saving faith. But all of these little subtleties were trying to get at the fact that the difference between the ascent that Satan has and that the ascent that we must have in order to be saved is that we must agree to the sweetness of Christ, to the loveliness of Christ, to the excellency of Christ. Satan knows the truth, objectively, of the person of Jesus, but he hates the truth. He doesn't see or acknowledge the excellency of Jesus, the loveliness of Jesus, because of his hatred. And that's what the Reformers were getting at. And what they were also trying to get at is that saving faith is not some easy affirmation where somebody raises their hand in an evangelistic meeting, and because they've made a profession of faith, therefore they have saving faith. No, saving faith is produced by the regenerating work of God the Holy Spirit. And if it is real, if it is genuine, then that person is linked by the sole instrument of justification, by that faith to Christ, and receives all that He is and all that He's done. The second major objection given by Rome to the Protestant view in the 16th century was that the Reformation view of justification involved God in what Rome called a legal fiction that really undermines the integrity of God. What they mean by a legal fiction, you know what a fiction is. A fiction is something that is make-believe. It's made up. It doesn't necessarily correspond with reality. And the question they're raising is, how can God, in His perfect righteousness and holiness, ever declare a sinner to be just who, in fact, is not just? That would involve God in a fictional declaration. And of course, the Protestant response to that was somewhat simple. It's saying that the reason why God declares people just is because God really imputes the real righteousness of Christ to that person. There's nothing fictional at all about Christ's righteousness, and there's nothing fictional at all about God's gracious imputation of that righteousness to somebody who, under analysis, doesn't have it themselves. But the third and far and away, the biggest objection that Rome gave in the 16th century and used as biblical fodder 
for their rejection of the Protestant view in the Council of Trent at the sixth session was the teaching of James with respect to justification. In the second chapter of the book of James, we read as follows. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? That's verse 21. And then verse 23, and Scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then, listen to what James says, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, could you have, possibly have, a more clear, declarative, indicative statement than we find here in the book of James, in which James said, you see then, the man is justified by works and not by faith alone. That text was brought up to Luther again and again and again in a weak moment. He even questioned the canonicity of the book of James, saying that James was an epistle of straw. That was his retreat of, uh, of the last resort. But when scholars look at the difference between Paul's teaching in Romans 3, 4, and 5 and James' teaching in chapter 2, they look at it in different ways. Some people say that the book of James was written before the epistle to the Romans, and one of the things on Paul's agenda in writing Romans was to correct the mistake that was taught by James in his epistle. Others say, no, Romans was written first and then James, and part of James' agenda was to offer a corrective to the erroneous teaching of the Apostle Paul. Others say it doesn't matter who wrote first or second. This is a clear example of the different apostles of the first century having different theologies, and there's no consistent monolithic view of justification to be found in the New Testament. But those who believe that the Bible is the Word of God and that in the book of James is inspired by the Holy Ghost and that the book of Romans is inspired by the Holy Ghost, they can't get off the hook so easily. They are faced with the difficult task of reconciling the two books. Now, it would be nice to say that when <clears throat> James speaks of justification, he uses one Greek word, and when Paul speaks of justification, he uses a different Greek word. No, the problem is both of them use the same Greek word, dikaiosune. Now, it would also be nice to say that when James was speaking, he gave one patriarch as an example to give his viewpoint, where Paul gave a different uh, witness from history to his viewpoint. But again, unfortunately, Exhibit A in that Paul's doctrine of justification is Abraham. And in James's doctrine of justification, his Exhibit A is Abraham as well. So the more we look at this, the more the plot thickens and the greater the difficulty seems to be in reconciling the two views. Now, I think in order to reconcile them, we have to look at two very important things. Though both refer to Abraham, the citation to Abraham's justification by Paul is in Genesis chapter 15. And again, in Romans, Paul labors the point that Abraham was counted righteous before he had done any of the works of the law before he had sacrificed Isaac on the altar. So that from chapter 15 and onward, Abraham was already in a state of justification. Whereas when James speaks of Abraham as his 
uh, favorite witness. He refers to Abraham's activity in Genesis 22, which is the record of Abraham's obedience to God's call to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar. So when James is talking about Abraham's justification, he is referring primarily to the action that takes place in Genesis 22, where Paul is laboring the point that Abraham is justified freely and by grace without having done any work, without ever deserving anything, looking back at Genesis 15. But I think the real resolution of the difficulty has to come by examining this. What question is Paul answering in Romans? And is it the same question that James is addressing in James chapter 2? I think that's the key to understanding these two writings, Paul and James. And in order to look at that, let's look at James where in verse 14 of chapter 2, he asks this question, what does it profit, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith, and we can supply the word here, can that, quote, faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things that are needed for the body, what does it profit? Also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is faith, is dead. Now you see that the question that James is trying to ask is this, if somebody says he has faith, but has no works, that there's no works that ensue from his profession of faith. Can that kind of faith save him? Well, how would Luther answer that question? Of course not. That's why Luther said we're justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. If the faith that we profess is a naked faith, without any evidence of works, that is not saving faith. It doesn't save anybody. That's dead faith. It is not what Luther called a fides viva. The only kind of faith that justifies anybody is a fides viva, a vital faith, a living faith, a faith that is alive and shows its life by obedience, by the works that follow from it. Which works contribute how much to the justification? Nothing. The ground of our justification is not found in the works that follow from our justification. But if the works don't follow from our justification, that is proof positive that we're not justified people, that we don't have saving faith. And so the question James is asking is, If a person says he has faith and has no works, will that faith save him? And he says, no, that faith is dead and it doesn't profit. He said, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Now we see here that the question that is in the forefront of James' consideration is the manifestation or the showing of faith. To whom? Does God have to wait to see my works to know whether my profession of faith is genuine? Did not God know that Abraham possessed saving faith all the way back in Genesis 15, and Paul labored the point that once that real, authentic, genuine faith was present, God counted him righteous. But if I say to you, I have faith, 
and I have no works. What other way do I have to demonstrate to you that my profession of faith is authentic except by my obedience, by my manifestation of works? Now, when Paul uses the term justify, he's using it in the highest theological sense of how a person is made just before God, before the bar of His justice, and is reconciled into a state of salvation. When James is speaking about justification here, he's talking about justifying a claim to faith before men. Jesus Himself used the term justification in a light manner when He said, wisdom is justified by her children. What did He mean by that? He didn't mean that wisdom is brought into a reconciling relationship to God by having babies. What He meant was that an act that we think was wisdom or a wise act will be demonstrated to be wise by the fruit that it bears. And so what James is addressing here is the demonstration or manifestation of true faith. And when he says, Abraham, our father, was justified by works when he offered Isaac his son, not before God, but he vindicated or demonstrated that his claim to faith was genuine for all of us to see. And he goes on to say that faith was working together with his works, and his work by works his faith was made complete. And the Scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, so that he was justified, not in the sight of God, but in the sight of men. His profession of faith is vindicated, not his soul is put in a state of reconciliation. Now, if we look at that carefully and think through the different questions that are being addressed, you'll see that the difficulty evaporates. But when Paul is dealing with the doctrine of justification in the sense of our ultimate reconciliation with the just and holy God, he writes this whole epistle to explain how ultimate salvation is accomplished, and it's there in Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, in which the apostle, you know, labors the point that it's not by the works of the law, but it's by faith apart from the works of the law that we are justified that we are justified not by our own righteousness, but by the righteousness of Christ. You know, let me finish by saying this. I've, I've said to my students in seminary many times, the doctrine of justification by faith alone is really not all that hard to understand. It doesn't require a PhD in theology to plumb the contents of the doctrine. As simple as it is, as easy it is to understand. It's one of the hardest truths of Scripture to get into the bloodstream, that we really understand that there's nothing we can do to earn, to deserve, to add to the merit of Jesus Christ, that when we stand before the judgment seat of God, we come with nothing in our hands except clinging to the cross of Christ and putting our trust in Him and in Him alone. That's why the Reformers ended their confession always with the words, Sola Deo Gloria, to God alone is the glory because salvation is of the Lord.